Welcome to Libertarian Counterpoint. Our panelists today are James Just, who's vice party of Sacramento County. Mike Giles, who's a astute teacher and recovering Democrat. Is that yes, valid? Yes. My name is Lee Welter. I enjoy working with the television production and uh, teach part-time in EMS education, do several other voluntary and fun things. Not remunerative enough, but that's all right. Money isn't everything, <laughs> only when it comes to paying the bills. <laughs> to kick off our topics list this evening, repeating mistakes that led to the Great Recession, the Fed, that's the Federal Reserve System, lowers interest rates. Uh, does anybody understand what the Federal Reserve is really about and who they benefit and who they cost? Uh, I'm, I'm a real skeptic. Well, the lowering of the interest rates is essentially repeating the mistakes of, what, 10 years ago when we had the Great Recessions. You're priming the pump of, of the system, which essentially just inflates whatever bubble is, on, is there, which makes the eventual crash even worse. It makes it easy for people to spend money, easy that, to borrow and spend. Right. And if the, if the uh, expenditures are wise and productive, it's good for everybody. But if they make mistakes, and easy money is too easy to spend. They well, call other people's money, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, it's, where, it's where the easy money ends up going. If it goes into a, an overinflated housing market, well, then all you end up with is more overinflated housing market. If it's going into an area that needs investment for, say, a factory, then the factory gets built, and, and that's all kind of fine. But we know where it actually ends up going. It goes into where the easy money is, and the easy money is in the real estate in like the Bay Area and all that. And it, we know where, how that ends. It ends up in a big crash. you have any thoughts, Mike? Uh, yeah. My, uh, a good friend of mine, his name is Larry, uh, has this wonderful wife. And uh, about that time period, 10 years ago or so, a little bit more, I think, um, they moved and wanted to buy another house. So um, he was flummoxed that the bank insisted on loaning them more money than they needed. And oh, he said, he, he furiously said no, and boy, they got mad at him. But the whole idea of uh, borrowing more money than you need, then there's all this extra money floating around and each dollar is worth less. Oh yeah, uh, that, that's <laughs> great. The, 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 the Federal Reserve has a strange function that would put any of us in prison. It's called counterfeiting, but it's <laughs> yeah. legalized because yeah. <laughs> they have approval. And that started in 1913. That was a Woodrow Wilson bad, very destructive year, as it turns out. But we'll, we'll get to some of his we'll get other to him bad later, ideas yeah. as well. Oh, boy. And I also uh, recall reading that there was something called the Community Reinvestment Act that said there are people that are too poor to buy houses, but we should make it easy for them to borrow and so they can have, enjoy the, the, uh, the pride in, uh, yeah. of ownership of, of, of their own homes. But uh, one of the problems, as I saw it, was the, um, what was called the derivatives. Somebody thought, well, if you have one high-risk loan, you have to charge more because you're in trouble. But if you put enough of those high-risk loans together, they're not likely to all fail at once. Wrong. <laughs> yeah, well, when they, all, when they all start failing, it becomes uh, kind of a cascading event. But the real problem is actually more fundamental. It goes down to, to property value and, and housing tax and, and housing costs. As property value goes up, housing costs go up, and so poor people can no longer afford to buy the housing. Yeah. And so you end up giving them you know, loans they can't afford at, at exceedingly low interest rates that end up ballooning it later on. And so you end up with this, and, and who actually benefits from the the prop high property values is fundamentally the government because they collect all the taxes, which means they want you to buy and sell as often as possible so, the, so that the, you know, the raising value becomes, right, so they can tax that raising value. It, it's, a, it's a nasty set of circumstances. And there was another repercussion, I believe. Uh, what do they call it? Quantitative easing? Uh, that's uh, taking poorly managed uh, enterprises and rewarding them by giving them more money instead of, why not bankruptcy? What, 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 what's the difference between those, between paying the poor managers or letting the poor managers say, well, let's put the management in the hands of people that are more responsible and can do, make this a productive uh, business? Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, the result of 
that business of uh, making people that couldn't really afford the houses, but they were forced to be given houses that they couldn't really afford. Crazy, yes. It was their the government's contempt for those people because they all, I shouldn't say all of them, but a giant percentage of them lost their homes because they couldn't keep up the payments. And so slowly over a period of time, they lost them. And so then they're out on the street again. and, and um, But the dollars are worth all less because it all went through this big system that you're describing. Uh, so it's a pretty sad story. Well, yeah, and then it leads into neighborhoods like mine where a lot of those people were lit, used to live who could no longer afford those houses. Then it has the gentrification issue where people from the Bay Area come in, they see these houses. To them, it's cheap. To us, a $500,000 house in my neighborhood is ridiculous. But to someone from the Bay Area, you know, a shack is at $1.2 million. You come in here and see a nice little cottage for $500,000. That's a great deal. And so you end up with the whole gentrification issue. But they were actually gentrified out of their own neighborhoods. They could no longer afford to live in their <laughs> Bay Area neighborhood. So they had to move to this one. And so it's just it's this whole continuing cycle where you continually push. So it's one domino after falling next. after the other. Yeah, and all because we have this strange love affair with property values defined by its resale value rather than, say, it's emotional value or its economic value like I live in the house my grandfather built and we use it as a homestead it was there to catch my family when we oh, needed that's wonderful when we needed a place to you know kind of rebuild our life and yeah, that's, that's kind great. of what our whole family has worked very hard for generations now to keep it that way that's true and and we should try to in encourage that view rather than a view use the property as a yes. as a just a investment a, a pure economic investment well there's another sad topic uh, there was a time, I believe, that treason was punished by execution. Is, is that right? Yeah. According to our view of history. Yeah, shot at sunrise. But uh, <laughs> you know. now there are people saying that nobody should be punished with capital, uh, for, for a capital crime with execution. Uh, we should just feed them and house them the, long, the, the rest and give them medical care for the rest of their natural lives or unnatural lives. And, uh, it's sort of sad because is the is our criminal justice system infallible? Are there are there instances where innocent people have been found guilty of very serious crimes and put at risk? Yeah, that's hard. That I makes I'm ambiguous about or ambivalent about this. Yeah, if they um, sometime back when this was being discussed, I remember thinking to myself. If a judge or DA or police officers conspired to lie to the court and allow an innocent person to be, um, um, you know, found guilty. It's outrageous, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, they should spend some time in jail, too. In fact, uh, I read, you know. and this may or may not be true. I, I'm not an expert, but uh, uh, somebody wrote that a uh, recently... Uh, former California Attorney General withheld exculpatory evidence in certain cases. That sounds, sounds pretty evil to me, but is that true or is it not well, true? Well, whether that particular case is true, we've actually seen the FBI lab has manufactured evidence. We've seen cases down in, in Florida where cops just got, another cop just got arrested in Florida for planting drugs on people. And so, so these kind of, if we could trust that the system was going to just get the worst of the worst and the clearest of the clear, then I'd be okay with capital punishment. But we can't trust the system to, to just be the worst of the worst and the clearest of the clear. And I'm not particularly happy with locking someone in a cage for 50, 60 years. That itself is kind of feels immoral. But you also said, what are you going to do for someone who's genuinely dangerous? It, it's a hard choice. But and there, there are some tools that, that didn't exist uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, there are a couple of fascinating books. One is titled The Psychopath Whisperer. It's about a research a psychologist who learned that a certain, a particular brain imaging technique can, is very characteristic of psychopaths. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find a 20 question checklist for psychopathy called the HAIR, H-A-R-E, uh, quiz or test uh -huh. uh, online. And uh, you read down that list and you said, these are the people we read about in the newspaper every day. 
<laughs> in the news. Yeah, well, I, I remember just very recently, I don't know quite where I, I read it, but um, there was a guy who murdered somebody, put in a California prison, and then inexplicably, in my mind anyway, released. And then he just went out and killed somebody else. Oh. Um, so that, that kind of stuff really, really bothers me. Um, uh, I don't know, you know, it's not like all killers are gonna, you know, go out and kill again, but um, it seems like there should be a little more care. <laughs> um, yeah, th and, these are tough issues, but we're not treated as tough issues, actually. We kind of, we kind of treat all these, all these, it's either, either or, right? It's either you're for the death penalty or against the death penalty, rather than, it's actually a very complex issue and we don't treat these things like as a complex issue. The death penalty is sitting someone in a cage, you know, for 50, 60 years till they die, is, that's a death penalty, it's just a slow one. In a way, yes. Yeah, and, it's a very expensive have some, one. We, yeah. see, we have some other new tools, the, uh, the fascinating DNA analysis that captured the, somebody who was murdered numerous people Decades ago. Yeah, yeah. Because, not because he donated his DNA, but, <laughs> but because there was DNA found at the scene, and they, they compared, his relatives had sent it to these, uh, analyze your yeah. ancestry and things, and they said, come, yeah. oh look, there's these components here, and these components here, and who has these in common? Oh yeah, your, 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 your third cousin here, right? <laughs> But I also have yeah. to go back to the crime labs. Do we trust the government crime labs to do their job properly and to analyze this stuff properly? And it doesn't always happen, does it? Yeah, it's, it's, we know from, you know, the FBI's been caught a number of times messing with data, messing with uh, results. There was um, a, cr a FBI crime lab lady five, six years ago who's actually now in jail because she fabricated evidence. So these aren't just simplistic issues. We like to yeah. think these would be nice and simplistic issues. Yes, we could trust the government to, the, you know, trust our prosecutors or our government to do the very best they can and occasionally they'll make mistakes and we can accept that. But some of these aren't occasional mistakes. They're deliberate mindset problems. It brings to mind one of my favorite books and, and uh, the gist of the book <coughs> uh, came, to, uh, came to me in an early morning radio interview where the interviewer was asked the, or said to the author, I've heard it said that you and your brother just ha happened to be born into a very wealthy family and you've enjoyed that luxury ever since. And the author said, yeah, I've heard that said too. The interviewer then said, tell us, what was the family business worth when you and your brother took over its management? $21 million. That's not bad at all. That's a lot of money by my standards. <laughs> yeah. And the next question, what is your family business worth now that you and your brother have been running it for a number of years? $100 billion. And I thought, wow. gosh, <laughs> this guy's doing something right. And so I bought the book. Uh -huh. I sent a copy of the book to my son, who's an executive. And uh, the gist of it is, the key to building a successful business is to hire the right people. The right people must have good values. If they have good values, you can teach them anything else they need to know. If they don't have good values, send them to work for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Send them to your competitor. That's <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, of yeah. course, yes. I, I heard that there's been, you know, the last 15 or 20 years, a slow change in the idea of uh, corporate uh, hiring of like big shots from, you know, Berkeley or Harvard or something like that, and they're realizing that they can just, all the people that already work for them, who are doing good and accelerating and rising, they can hire them and let them learn what they need to learn on the outside, but they bring all the positive values that they've already demonstrated. Uh, well, that's a plus. And, yeah. and uh, the author of that book did not specifically identify what he considered good values, mm -hmm. but I've I've uh, gone over it with some of my students. Uh, what, what do you think? What does it take to be a good leader? Number one, you have to learn to be a good follower first. Yeah, and, and you've got to be interested and, in helping. And what yeah. qualities do you want to see in your leaders? You want them to be honest, you want them to be dependable, and uh, 
kind and thoughtful and caring, all those nice things. I like that, but uh, we don't have any good tests for that yet, or well, do we? Well, one of the, th I hope you don't, I don't want to butt in. <laughs> no, you're fine. Uh, the, one of the things that they've discovered, and this is just random reading, but they, um, the corporate CEOs that are part of corporate uh, operations that make the most money are not those <clears throat> leaders. They're the, they're the guys that ask um, the other board members and ask the workers and ah, ask their, yes. own, they're, they're yes, interested yes. in learning and having kind of a cooperative effort so everybody cooperates to earn more money rather than just, I know what's good. Yes, you yes. Know, you could describe them as facilitators maybe. Yeah, something yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. In yeah. fact, that, that son that I mentioned uh, had some ideas. Well, he, he ran the software uh, development um, office in the Sacramento area, Rancho Cordova, oh. and uh, he was asked at, by the uh, board of directors, what, what progress, what have you accomplished since you've been with the company? He said, when I first started, there were 12 people in this department. Now there are only six of us, and we're doing twice as much work. Oh. So they liked the sound of that, <laughs> and, uh, and he, he went to the headquarters down south, and uh, had some ideas, and I asked, well, change is always difficult. People are very resistant. You tell them, mm -hmm. it's almost an insult to say, well, we could do a better job with this. You're saying we're not doing very well? We're dummies, we're, <laughs> yeah. we don't know our jobs? And, <laughs> yeah. and so I asked him, after he'd been there for a while, I said, well, how, is, how are you being accepted? He said, well, he said, okay, I think. He said, whenever I'm gone for a few days, and I come back, I found that somebody's already implementing some of the, the plans that I'd laid out for them. So oh. that's a good thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, th there's trust already shown. And so the receivers of that trust kind of return in kind. Exactly, um, yes. And that's without being told step one, step two, step yes. three. You in know. fact, um, several decades ago, there was a research group at uh, the national, the British National Health Systems Pediatric Cardiac Surgery Center at the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. They did a personality survey of the surgeons to see which ones are the best team builders, who has the characteristics of good communicators uh -huh. and good listeners and treating people decently, tactful, kind, that sort of thing. Uh -huh. And then, so they have this list, you know, here's, there's the best here and, and, and the least uh, accomplished here in that regard. Then they compared it with the outcomes, who had the best survival rate in their patients. Parallel, <laughs> almost parallel lines. So that tells you a lot, doesn't it? And which says to me, our medical schools start to need, start to look, should start looking for those qualities in the medical school applicants. But my prediction is we will see fewer and fewer MDs or DOs, physicians, in the future. And we will see more and more nurse practitioners, physician's assistants, paramedics, and the like doing their niche and extending their scope of practice somewhat under the leadership of a physician who has those good leadership qualities. But that's just me shooting my mouth off. What do I know? <laughs> No, well, that, that kind of goes along with, I heard this uh, lengthy interview, uh, just parts of it, because it went about two hours. This, this doctor, um, who was, a, um, in other words, he, he was describing in detail, even though his political party is the one that started Obamacare, he mm -hmm. was talking about the destruction that was wrought because of it. Yeah, and, but a uh, political party affiliation is just sort of a label for, for yeah, most of us, or but, but for he, lots of, he, he was for most of, of them, I should say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he was kind of defying the the line there because he was describing in incredible detail the giant harm to the patients and to the doctors' times and and the, all the other people too. They all they're all having to make all these adjustments just to make it work half as good as it used to work in the way he was describing uh, it. It is a challenge, yes. And, yeah. and there, uh, I asked a question once uh, of a, a group of uh, physicians, a, a committee meeting. Is it possible that there's a tendency for psychopaths 
which we mentioned earlier, uh -huh. uh, to rise to the top in terms of corporate management oh. or other or, <laughs> uh, 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 politics mm -hmm. where they, they like power. The psychiatrist uh, as a group said, We'll have to talk about that another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't want to. For example, <laughs> there may be some of those people in the committee. <laughs> oh, yikes. <laughs> well, psychopath <laughs> politics and, and, and leadership, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting today as we got out and we have politicians essentially out there promoting violence these days, right? Oh, it's awful, isn't it? Yes. In fact, uh, it, it's sort of been uh, peripheral. Like, don't 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 blame me. Uh, it's uh, these uh, these rabid students. Uh, uh, what do they call it? Antifa? Uh, and, they, they're 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 complaining and and being violent as their objection to violence. Yes, Is that it's, right? it's, it's they're, weird. They're promoting violence as a way to fight violence. It's like using racism to fight racism and then surprised that you ended up with more racism. It, <laughs> yeah. it, it, you know, you're, you're using violence to fight what you claim is violence and there, maybe there is some, there is some truth, there is some, but you know, you're using more violence to fight this low level of violence and you and surprised that Doesn't you end work. up with more violence. You, they're, they're but then we have one of, the, one of the uh, prominent uh, um, elected officials saying we need to force people to, to, to bend to our will, right? Yeah, well that seems to be a lot of political motivations these days, to force people one way or another, either economic pain, um, I won't say physical pain, social pain, um, well even physical pain, they're out there promoting violence, using, using physical pain to, to get people to either conform to the way they want or to shut up. One, it's one way to get attention, if nothing else. Well, yeah. it's not just for attention, it's to keep people off the streets. It's to keep the casual supporter from actually being supported. It's not so much for the, it's not, the violence isn't really aimed at the, at the, the hardcore supporters, of like the hardcore Trump supporters or the Trump violence at the hardcore left-wing supporters. It's, they're aimed to keep the average person from participating. That's the whole point. Yeah, in other words, they, they seem like a uh, resurrection of the National Socialist Workers Party street thugs of the 1930s. Um, you oh, know. like they call those the brown shirts? I guess so. Um, yeah, well, that's actually one of the interesting things about history. The brown shirts and the communists were fighting in the streets, which is actually why the public, the German public, got fed up enough to give Hitler the power to stop it. Even though Hitler was engaging in half the, the violence, he says, well, we like him better than those guys, and so they went with Hitler. And <laughs> uh, so as, as I've read, what we learned from history is that we don't learn from history, exactly. right? Exactly. Well, those of us who learn from history are doomed to scream at those at the rest of the world who is repeating. The uh, yeah, who just history. mindlessly repeat. Yeah. yeah. Very sad. Yeah. Well, we have more topics we can talk okay, about. Okay, sure. Here. Oh, yeah, this one, this one struck me as humorous. There was a, a, a story in a local paper about promoting a wealth tax. The people earn beyond a certain amount of money should have to pay even more than they do, which usually is a disproportionate <laughs> amount of uh, taxes. And some of the names they mentioned were family members of organizations that already have special tax privileges. Who remembers Dan Rostankowski, Chicago politician, right? Yeah. And he finally, I think he went to prison, and I don't know if he died in prison or I, I, think he went to, I know he went to prison, but I, I don't follow up. Uh, a okay, lot of those Chicago but, politicians yeah, I think How many Chicago mayors have gone but, into prison? I think almost all of them. But, but, <laughs> I, but I recall reading that when he was, that, that Rostenkowski was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, very influential oh, mm -hmm. in tax laws. Oh, geez. He wrote into the tax law, this business at this specific address in Chicago shall be exempt from whatever taxes they were talking about. And I said, those are his donors. The Prisker family oh. gave a huge campaign. And oh. it's, sort of a, it's sort of akin to, uh, what do we have? A state senator who's got close to a million dollars from pharmaceutical companies that manufacture vaccines. Oh. Pretty sick, isn't it? Yeah, well, and then you get guys like uh, Warren Buffett who says, well, my secretary pays a higher tax rate than I do. And so what, you deliberately organized your 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 compensation package to reduce your tax bill, and then yeah. you complain that you 
or deliberately organized your tax your your compensation to reduce uh, yeah, your tax bill. And, and it's the most absurd. Yeah, thing. to and, make it make happen. somebody happy. <laughs> Warren yeah. Buffett is very very clever. Yeah. There was a oil pipeline proposed, and he he encouraged people to uh, discourage that. Mm -hmm. Said go out and. You, you try to get out there and say you don't want to crossing your land. We can't have oil pipelines. What if it breaks and leaks and contaminates everything? Mm -hmm. The alternative was to use Warren Buffett's train, which yeah. is even higher risk to, to, to cart the oil. From <laughs> exactly. Down from I, I remember US. reading about that. And the trains would go through cities and, and you know all oh, sorts absolutely. of stuff that was very dangerous. Yeah. Well, that kind of stuff in the oil business goes all the way back to Standard Oil, where to, you know, Standard Oil would prevent a, a competitor's pipeline from going just by buying property so they couldn't get to it. So <laughs> this, yeah. is, this kind of thing has been long gone, but long, long ongoing. It's just the fact that we let it. Is, All right. We now have the government that not only lets it, but helps it. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, uh, there's, I, I just use the analogy of envelopes full of thousand dollar bills just quietly pushed across the table in, in a, in a, nighttime dinner, you know, in some fancy restaurant in downtown Sacramento. And and people, I mean, there's a reason why when I was a kid, every kid that wanted to in high school could work. Mm -hmm. Walk 200 yards, work 500 yards, walk a mile, and you could work at Mama Maybell's. It's, it's a wonderful um, saying, yeah. Yeah, uh, I washed dishes at 14. And, and yeah. The, yeah, but now, now we Mama Maybell's not there. Minimum wage, which means that unless you have a high enough skills to justify this, you don't get a job. You don't get your foot on the ladder to yeah, get well, started. Yeah, Denny's and, and um, all the big restaurants and, and fast food places have all paid that money. So the lawmakers make laws that make it almost impossible for Mama Maybell ever to start. Yeah, because the Walmarts of the world and the can afford to pay the, the $15 or $16 an hour, but what mom and pop some, shops some can't. can't. And, and yeah. even the big corporations, uh, Andy Puzder, who at the time was CEO of Hardee's and um, Carl's Jr. restaurants, said, uh, be, before this got pushed too far, said, currently every one of our employees earns the company $6,000 a year. If, if the uh, the minimum wage is raised to $15 an hour, every one of our employees will cost us $6,000 a year. Oh. That's a recipe for failure, isn't it? Oh, yes, of course. So we're, <laughs> we're running to the end of our string here. Please watch us on uh, Comcast Cable 17 uh, uh, Thursdays at uh, 8 o'clock, oh, okay. uh, Fridays at noon, and John uh, Cameron's favorite time, 4 a.m. on Saturday. 4 a.m. And you can find us on <laughs> YouTube. That's what I'm to awake. search yeah. Libertarian Counterpoint. Thanks for joining yeah. us, everybody.